Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, we proudly bring to you Mormonism Live! Shut up and sit down. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Good evening. How are you doing, Mr. Real? I am doing so good. I was, uh, you know, I was telling you off the air, I lost my voice a little bit this morning. We'll see how it goes. But so far, it, it cracked a few times. There it was. Well, um, anyway, my, my voice hopefully I know, holds this up. This is like an episode of from the Brady Bunch. Is it? Yes. When it's time to change, you've got to rearrange. We'll call you Peter tonight. Okay. Uh, maybe I'm just experiencing some development here on this side, uh, you know? I think you are. I think you are. And uh, the title of tonight's show is Bill Real Hits Puberty. I'm just waiting for the other one to drop. <laughs> I'm going to guess you mean shoe. <laughs> All right. So um, we can jump into it. If you have any thoughts before we start the show, anything else going on, folks, if you're... I seldom have thoughts, but it doesn't stop me from talking. Yeah. So anyway, anyway, this is so exciting tonight. Can I just say how excited I am about tonight's show? Please, by all means. Okay, I think I just did. But just when I think that there's nothing left to learn about Mormonism, you find this incredibly colorful character, which somehow I managed to go to church for 40 years and study like crazy, not necessarily a lazy learner. And yet I'd never heard of this fellow before, but he's an important character in early Mormonism, isn't he? He is. And the, and I didn't know anything about him either. The only reason that I came across this story was I have a uh, a friend that lives out in Leverkin, uh, Utah, who uh, used to also be with Fair Mormon. And he reached out to me and said he had a bunch of Sunstone magazines that he was going to throw away and wondered if I could use them, if they might provide some content for episodes. So he brought them to Family Pond on one of my last days there. And uh, he brought them into me. I put them in my van, got home, and I started going through them. And in between a few of them, in between the few of them was this uh, this proclamation broadside, uh, April uh, Kirtland, April sixth, so the Jesus's birthday, um, mm, yes. April sixth, eighteen fifty one, a proclamation. And then when you open it up, there's a description of what it is here, and it's notes on the document. This was done by H. Michael Marcourt, and it's I've heard the of him. what's that? I've heard of him. Yes, he's a prominent author uh, within Mormonism. And he says the foregoing is a recreation of the rare broadsheet, a proclamation published by Francis Gladden Bishop. And I figure if Michael Marcourt thought this was important to Mormon history, it probably was. And so I spent a day going down the uh, Google rabbit hole, looking up everything I could on this guy and putting together a, uh, a show tonight for our, for our viewers and our listeners and to go over this guy's life and to share a bunch of stuff with him. And over the last week, you and I have been diving into the life of Francis Gladden Bishop. And uh, with that, we can we can sort of here jump into it. So I'm going to put up on the screen that slide there. And I will uh, begin. And by, by all means, you know, jump in wherever. But I know kind of the places that you and I have talked where you've got some research on on your end as well, but feel free to comment otherwise. I wanted to start off just mentioning uh, Zechariah chapter five, verses one and two. It says, then I turned and lifted up mine eyes and looked and behold a flying roll. The length thereof is 20 cubits and the breadth thereof 10 cubits. And the so reason that's a that's, big roll. It was. And the reason that's important is because in the early life of Francis Gladwell, he was born so he's Francis Gladden, I keep saying Gladwell, but Francis Gladden Bishop, born on June 19th, 1809. He was born in Livonia, Livingston County, New York, the third of nine children, born to devout Methodist Isaac Gates Bishop and Mary Hyde. No relation, as far as I know, to the Mormon Hydes, but not too far away. Uh, this is also near 
kind of the left end or the west end of the Finger Lakes, whereas Palmyra is on the east end north of uh, of the one of the Finger Lakes there. And you see on the map kind of the distance. It's a, it looks like it's a 49-minute uh, drive. Looks like it's 36 point something miles. Um, he's the third of nine children born to the those parents. According to some reports, Mary Hyde Bishop, his mother, was a religious enthusiast and previous to Gladden's birth, had predicted that she would bear a son who would someday gladden the hearts of the people and would be the flying role which Zacharias saw with his prophetic eye. And I just want to note here that if you're a child born in the 1800s to uh, devout folks of religion and your mother has this visionary um, idea of, of, of who you're going to be and how you're going to turn out and what kind of role and mission you're going to have in this life, it, it certainly can be understood that someone would take that very seriously. No different, by the way, than Joseph Smith Jr., the prophet, when was it his grandfather, Aziel, who said that uh, he, Joseph Smith Jr., would play this prominent role uh, it, within religion uh, later you know, in his life? And so mm-hmm. the Smith family recounts that story in the same way that Francis Gladden Bishop looks back on his mother's uh, description of what he would accomplish in his life. Um, on July 2nd, 1832, Bishop was baptized by Latter-day Saint missionaries at Olean, New York, and I might pronounce some of these things wrong, but Olean, New York, and became a member of the Church of Christ. Of course, that's what it was called at the time, which had been founded two years earlier by Joseph Smith. And then... um, Right. Can I just throw in here and say it's an amazing coincidence because before I was born, my mother had a vision that someday I would be a minor podcast celebrity. So there's a lot of that going on out there. You've nailed These it. mothers, they're in tune with the spirit like <laughs> nobody else. And the flying roll, just to go back, my understanding is Please. that a roll is the King James version of the word that is a scroll. It's actually a scroll that's flying through the heaven. It's big, so it's got a lot of writing on it, maybe 116 pages worth. But I think the idea is like it's a message from God, hence it's flying through the yeah. air. And it seems strange, right, that she's saying that he will be essentially scripture. So she's, you know, she's essentially predicting that he'll fill the role of David Bednar before Bednar comes along. Boom. Great minds. Two minds with but a single thought, my friend. So um, here, this image you're looking at now is one manuscript page of um, priesthood licenses. Uh, that the church would have written to those who went off from the church to uh, look after a congregation or to go out into the mission field, for instance. And so Bishop uh, became an elder of the church. And and from my reading, there's a long thesis document uh, that you located, by the way. I couldn't find it. I knew it existed, but I couldn't find where it was, and you located it. I read a bunch of that today, and it appears as though Francis Gladden Bishop was ordained an elder in 1832, but doesn't get his license until what you see here, which is dated April 14th, 1840. And I actually have a close up of it. It took him eight years. Eight years to get the church to write it out on paper. And this guy's life is interesting. This will sort of play out later on on this, him constantly going back and forth to the church to try to get them to do things for him to kind of raise his notoriety. Um, But again, this is his elder's license. You can see there, this may certify that Francis G. Bishop has been uh, regularly ordained an elder according to the rules and regulations of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Notice, by the way, capital D on Latter-day, and appears to be a maybe a lowercase s on saints, and has... Can I just say that I could see that as a capital D or possibly it's a lowercase D with a very big and curvy tail. And you see the and upper, the the sentence above it and to the left, you have the same thing. So I'll bet that is a lower D, even though it looks like a capital D at first. You might. Yeah, you might have nailed it. Good job. Um, uh, And has received a license from under our hands this 14th day of April, 1840. Uh, again, they're post-dating it because the stuff that we read showed that it occurred in uh, 
1832. But Joseph Smith. Right, but notice they're not saying he was ordained on this day, just receiving a license. So possibly yeah. he's going to go off on a mission somewhere where there are other Latter day Saints. And this is what he takes with him to prove that he actually does come with authority from God. Yep. And signed Joseph Smith Jr., president. And then H. Smith assumed that's Hiram Smith, clerk. Uh, and I don't know what that word underneath might be, but uh, there's that. Um, let's see here. So Bishop became an elder uh, for a brief period of time in 1833. He was the president of a congregation of Latter-day Saints at Westfield, New York. At some point, Bishop was also ordained to the priesthood office of 70. And we'll see that play out here in a little bit. Um, in 1838 and 1839, a Bishop was a missionary for the church in the Eastern States Mission 1834. And the reason it's called the Eastern States Mission 1834 is because it goes away. It's, it's disbanded. And then back in like 1890 or so, it is reorganized uh, again. And so they needed a way to distinguish the folks who served in the earlier Eastern States mission versus those who served in the later Eastern States mission. So the earlier one is called Eastern States Mission 1834. He was around age 24 at the time. This mission would have included North Carolina, Virginia, which would have included present day West Virginia, Maryland, New York, Massachusetts, Upper and Upper Canada. During his mission, Bishop published a short history of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, an excerpt apparently written by Bishop himself in the journal history makes it sound as if his 1834 mission was part of the mission he left on in 1833. So I don't, I don't know what that means. It means essentially what I take it to mean is he leaves in 1833, although the church doesn't officially call it the 1833 Eastern States mission. It's the 1834 Eastern States mission. And he very quickly gets himself into, into some trouble. Oh, good. On, now we get to the good stuff. Oh, yeah. So August 7th, 1835, Bishop was disfellowshipped from the church by a high council of the church at Bradford, Massachusetts, because it was proved, quote, it was proved that he had erred in spirit and in doctrine and was considerably inclined to enthusiasm and much lifted up, unquote. On September 28th, 1835, uh, the presiding high council at Kirtland, Ohio, reinstated Bishop and warned him against advancing heretical doctrines, which were derogatory to the character of the Church of the Latter-day Saints, unquote. However, one contemporary commentator stated that, quote, Gladden gave Joseph much trouble, was cut off from the church, and taken back and rebaptized nine times, unquote. Wow, I think that might be a record. That's a lot, you know. I, I don't know if I'm ever going to get back in on a second time, but for him, he he was able to repent and be forgiven and reinstated. Um, and and maybe we should stop here and just talk about this because we've mentioned this in our conversation this week that you can say all the things you want negative about Mormonism's early leaders and specifically Joseph Smith, but it seems really clear from this example and at least a half dozen others that I've come across in my time of studying church history, where Joseph Smith probably has really good reason to just cast off some of these folks. And he seems to tolerate, forgive, and allow back in multiple members who other members of early leadership are suggesting not be that not be done. And it seems as though Joseph Smith really does forgive easily and allow folks to um, go back to their previous station in the church without a lot of shame or judgment. And they just get to go back to the way things were prior to whatever thing they did that, that got them on the bad side of the church. Any thoughts there? Nine times. This is amazing. This is almost once a year on average. And, you know, I never hear about this, this gentleman, Gladden Bishop, Francis Gladden Bishop, but the one I always hear about in this context is William W. Phelps, who, of course, got crossways with Joseph Smith in 1838, the Missouri War, and then later on comes back, and there's the wonderful story about how Joseph Smith says to him, um, welcome, uh, what is it, back, uh, dear brother, welcome, dear brother, since the war has passed, for friends at first, or friends again at last. But I think we hear that story in church because William W. Phelps stays in the church after that and keeps writing hymns and being an important figure. 
this guy I never heard about, even though he's got William W. Phelps beat hands down with the number of times he's come back and getting rebaptized, but he doesn't stay solid in the faith after that. In fact, he becomes a thorn in the side to a number of church leaders, which I know you're going to go into. Yeah. In a later statement in 1853, Apostle Parley P. P. Pratt said, quote, as to this man or rather thing called Gladden Bishop and his Ouch. pretended and his pretended visions and revelations, I know him of old. I knew him in Ohio some 18 or 20 years ago. I remember his name. I scarcely ever heard that name in my life, that it was not associated with some imposition or falsehood in the name of the Lord. If he was tried before the councils of the church, he would confess that he had lied in pretending to visions, angels, and revelations, and ask forgiveness. If he was excommunicated, he would join again, etc., unquote. And so what we end up with here on the screen, uh, this is an 1840 journal account of Francis Gladden Bishop taken from the 70s and placed in the high priest without any ordination. And so um, that's the far away. Let me get the close up of it. And it's also got, this is an interesting thing. And this is where the Joseph Smith Papers Project is really helping us out in um, pushing the church to be honest and transparent and forthright. Because you have this journal entry. And if you want to read the, the writing on the right, but I'll just stay, I'll just, I'll just say about it that there are these moments in church history here where Francis Gladden Bishop is something's happening with him and uh, they've struck it from the record, that big backward Z. And then you see the word out and this almost like a big O kind of to the right of out. This is meant to not be included in any future transcript of the record, but these documents then have been handed to the Joseph Smith papers project, the church history department and they made the effort to transcribe it still, even though it was said to be struck out. And then they show that it was struck out, but at least now we get to read it and see it and look it up in the original documentation. Do you mind reading this? And we'll talk about this for a moment, uh, this story that happens with him. Sure thing. So this is from April 6th, 1840. April and is it the 6th, history of the church? Yeah. Yep. What is, is that the history of the church on the left that is struck out? It's in handwriting. Is that what that is? It is, um, it's, it's an 1840 journal account from church leadership about the affairs of the church. I don't have okay, the specific well, all... document that it came from, but I, it will be in the resource notes of the episode. Okay, so it starts off with the date, April 6th, made some observations on the business of the conference, exhorted the brethren who had charges to make against individuals and made some very appropriate remarks respecting pulling the beam out of their own eye that they might see more clearly the moat, which was in their brother's eye. Now we get to the part that's all marked out in the manuscript version. A letter was read from the presidents of the 70s, wishing for an explanation of the steps which the high council had taken in removing Elder Francis Gladden Bishop from the quorum of the 70s to that of the high priests without any other ordination than he had been in the quorum of the 70s and wished to know whether those ordained into the 70s at the time Elder Bishop was had a right to the high priesthood or not. Continuing with the part that's marked out, several persons spoke on the subject after which the president gave a statement of the authority of the 70s and said they were elders and not high priests. And consequently, Elder Bishop, this is uh, Francis Gladden Bishop, Elder Bishop had no claim to the high priesthood. On motion, resolved that Elder Francis Gladden Bishop be placed back into the quorum of the 70s. So that ends the part that was marked out. It all has to do with Gladden Bishop. And then the final line that is not marked out in this entry is on motion, resolved that the conference adjourn until two o'clock. Yeah. And so what you end up with here, and there's maybe a few facets that we've got to talk about. One is that for the younger people watching this show, what you don't know is that if you go back far enough, and it's before my time in the church, by the way, RFM. And so I'd be curious if this, you experienced this or not, but by the time I come into the church, seventies are only uh, authorities beyond the local level. Yeah. They're and, just general authorities when you come in, but there were old, there were old gentlemen in my ward who as kind of a, 
like a proud thing, something that they were really proud of is the, Hey, years ago, I used to be a 70 mm -hmm. and they said it like it was comparable to the seventies that now serve as, you know, authorities above the local level, beyond the stake mm -hmm. level, higher up. But in reality, back then a 70 was really just a ward missionary, if I'm not mistaken. It was sort of like that. I believe it was every stake had a quorum of 70s in it. I think it was like, um, well, it was like high priest, but different. Okay. So the seventies are there. Uh, they probably have a president, so it's different than high priest, blah, blah, blah. But the basic thing is this, is that you've got seventies who are members of the ward and members of the stake. And they met in their quorums, just like the elders would meet in their quorum and the high priest would meet in their group. Right. And the main understanding at the time was very simple. The high priests were in charge of temple work. The 70s were in charge of missionary work and the elders were in charge of uh, home teaching and moving and things like that. But it was the early 80s. They got rid of the 70s on the local level. It was um, maybe it wasn't the early 80s. It was during the reign or presidency of Ezra Taft Benson. I believe he made an announcement discontinuing them. So I does that answer your question? Yeah. And. Uh, a 70 in this, so this 70 that we're looking at on the screen would be a precursor uh, to the 70s of these gentlemen that were in the ward that I, you know, I, I was in the church with and who thought of, you know, said, hey, like years ago, I used to be a 70. Again, as you pointed out, they were over missionary work. He was a 70 and sent out to essentially do missionary work. And what happens is that somewhere out there in, in the mission field or wherever, somebody ordains him from a 70 ordains him to a high priest. Uh, and I shouldn't even say that. They they give him the office, but there is no ordination. I'm saying that wrong. So he moves from the office of 70 to the office of high priest, but he hasn't been ordained. And he spent his, by the way, one thing the folks here listening or following along don't know is that Francis, Francis Gladden Bishop was an elder in 1832. He's sent out into the mission field and he's overseeing a congregation. Some gentleman is sent from the church to take over for him, and that gentleman is a high priest. And Francis Gladden Bishop is a little disrupted by the fact that he wasn't given the heads up, and this other person comes in and is kind of trying to take over. He has this other office. Um, Francis wasn't given any heads up that it was happening, so he, he doesn't really trust that it's true. So then he leaves and goes to uh, back to to wherever the church is, I'm assuming Kirtland, but he goes back to the church and um, he, he says like, I'd like to be a high priest. And they tell him, no, you can't be. And so now here we are years later in 1840 and he finally gets his dream call. He's finally a high priest. And there's multiple points in the historical record where he intimates that he wants to be a high priest and have the, I'll say notoriety, but he, he doesn't word it that way. He, he makes it sound more humble than that but it's really his dream calling to be a high priest in the church. And he finally gets it. And the church, somebody in the higher up of the church notices that he is a high priest, but he'd never been ordained a high priest. And so a conversation ensues. Hey, here's the 70. He now holds the office of high priest, but he's never been ordained to being a high priest. What should we do? And a, a discussion ensues. And then when it says the president of the priesthood, they're talking about Joseph Smith there. Joseph Smith then lays down the rule, which is that 70 is comparable to elder and that for one to be a high priest, they must be ordained separately. Hence, Francis Gladden Bishop must go back into the 70s. And I can only imagine in this moment that he felt embarrassment. Uh, he, he felt offense. Um, but, but it's important to note that this rule, and because this is the moment where they, they have this idea, they haven't really regulated it. Joseph Smith speaks on the subject. And from here on forward, there is a little bit of a different understanding of how priesthood works, how these offices are separated. And the church going forward uses this instance as part of its, how it came to define things the way it did. Right. So it's not clear to me why this part is marked out in the manuscript is it because of gladden bishop or is it because they've changed things since the time that this was written at this point it appears that the priesthood and its offices are in flux a bit today we think of 
the Melchizedek priesthood being an elder. That is the highest authority that there is. We think of uh, the Melchizedek priesthood as being the high priesthood today. What this entry that was marked out suggests is that that's not the way it was considered back then and that there was actually a separate high priesthood, which you had to have in order to be a high priest. It wasn't just a matter of office, but a matter of priesthood is what it appears here. So the, the LDS Church has a bunch of priesthoods. If you track them from the earliest day, there's the Levitical priesthood, the Aaronic priesthood, the Melchizedek priesthood, the high priesthood, the patriarchal priesthood. But uh, today we're content really with just two. Yeah. Um, and I don't know why this was crossed out. I don't know why the church, and again, we don't, we don't even know when this got crossed out. Um, we can assume it happened around the time that it was written, but I don't know that. Um, I don't know. And I don't really. I, I really can't make sense of why it would have been mm -hmm. done because it seems like it would have been an important note to keep in terms of regulating how priesthood offices work and where how one would transition from one office to another. Right. It would be important unless it contradicted the way things came to be ironed out and correlated. Yeah. And so again, we don't. We don't. We don't have that reason, but we can essentially be left guessing. Um, and then. Just to note here, I've got another one. I'm going to put it up on the screen here. Present, share screen, share. Oh, and that's not going to cooperate, is it? There we go. So this is a letter from Francis Gladden Bishop uh, to uh, Joseph Smith and to the church. And I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I just want to note that he reads a bunch of like um, chapters from the Bible. He's trying to establish... Um, kind of his his thoughts that he should be elevated in the church. And, and he's not in the church at the time. So he writes Joseph Smith and sort of preaches to Joseph and then asks to be let back into the church um, just to kind of play off on the fact that this guy is constantly running into the church authorities, being disfellowshipped, let back in, moved around in offices. Those weren't handled right. And, and so it's kind of, his, his life in the church is really chaotic. As I was studying uh, his life, I, I was amazed that, one, the church dealt with him so many times letting him back in, as you pointed out, but also that he kept coming back. Like, he really was passionate about Mormonism. He really did want to be part of the church, but he always has this inkling of wanting to be a leader, feeling like he deserves more, and trying to convince church leadership of that. And so this is one of the said, letters that does that. Right. And this is a letter sort of written in exile. I think it was in, from Augusta, Maine, right? Yeah. And Where this he's is writing the, this. 26 September of 1843. And he's writing it to Joseph Smith. He's citing all of these scriptures from the Old Testament, which he is implicitly applying to himself. He seems to want to be a second leader in the church together with Joseph Smith. And he says, even if you don't let me back in, I'll be out here. I'll be in exile. I'll still be defending the faith. Wherever there's cops beating up a guy, I'll be there. And I don't know if he ever, I don't know if this time he got back in, because this is September 26, 1843. So in other words, getting uh, closer to the end of Joseph Smith's life, which will be June of the following year. Yeah. But this may inform why it was that he was angling to become a high priest and have the high priesthood because he would have to have that in order to be a co-president of the yeah. church. And in the thesis thing that I, I, that you found and that I was spending a lot of time uh, this morning reading it at some point in his life, he claims that a, uh, a spiritual ministering servant, an angel of some sort comes and visits him and ordains him to a high priest. So he finally gets his, his office that he's been wanting. And um, in he claimed lots of, lots of spiritual visitations. And in doing so, and we'll get into some of these stories here as we go along, but in doing so, he, he kind of recreates his own path to being a leader because the church keeps turning him down. And it, his life, again, I think is quite interesting. Um, and I'm actually quite interested in the, the gentleman who wrote the thesis on him 
I'm quite intrigued on where he got all of his information because he has a ton of stuff. It's like 247 pages. Mm -hmm. And as you pointed out and I pointed out, there just really is, this isn't a story that's out there and there really isn't a ton of information on it. Um, okay. Excommunication. Uh, well before the death of Joseph Smith in 1844, Bishop began to inform others that he had been chosen by God as Smith's rightful successor. In 1842, Bishop was excommunicated for heresy. And this, again, we're talking about this letter that we just showed on the screen before this document being put back up, which was 1843. So a little bit after uh, his being excommunicated. Bishop claimed that although Smith had originally been chosen by God, he had become a fallen prophet. We've heard that line before uh, due to his immorality and other sins. At the church trial that led to Bishop's final excommunication, Smith commented that Bishop, quote, was a fool and had not sent sufficient for the Holy Ghost to enlighten him, unquote. Uh, any thoughts there? Zing. Yeah, that hurts, doesn't it? Yeah. Here's this guy. All he's trying to do is take over the church. And it's like That's Joseph Smith to is taking it personally. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, Gladden's of course, this would be this would be the last time, right? This would be like the ninth time he was disciplined. This is it. This is it. I mean, he's he's out. He wants back in. And again, that letter I had up on the screen. I mean, it, I would suggest folks go read this after this episode's over. He he's not begging the prophet to get back in, but you can tell that's his goal. But at the same time, he is preaching to Joseph Smith, telling him all the scriptures that indicate that Francis Gladden Bishop should be his right-hand man. Um, yeah, I'm the flying roll, baby. That's right. What's not to like? <laughs> so there's that. All right, Gladden's claims. Let's uh, put the next slide up. Bishop asserted that Smith had been given the Aaronic priesthood by an angel, but his sinfulness prevented his reception of the Melchizedek priesthood. Bishop claimed that he himself had been given the Melchizedek priesthood by Jesus Christ. So I put a, now, by the way, there's no existing picture of Francis Gladden Bishop. I went looking for a young pioneer face from an old vintage photo. This was the best I could come up with. Um, but he, he claims that Peter, James, and John never did come uh, to Joseph Smith at some point and says like, hey, he didn't receive Melchizedek priesthood, but I got it. And then in this thesis paper, quite interesting, um, the author of the paper claims that Francis Gladden uh, Bishop stated that who came to ordain him was a person by the name of Nephi. And well, you mean ordain, not give him the Melchizedek priesthood because that's Jesus, right? No. So he says that um, he was given the Melchizedek priesthood by Nephi and Nephi brought two other angelic ministers with him. And this Nephi told Francis Gladden Bishop that it was actually him and the other two who went to try to give Joseph Smith the Melchizedek priesthood, but that they went in the identity of Peter, James, and John. Now, mm. does that, doesn't that sound strange? And you think it sounds strange, but remember for folks who have been through the temple that Peter, James, and John also used deception and don't come down in their true identity the first time visiting Adam and Eve. And so this would be, and this was like the late 1830s, this would be Francis Gladden Bishop hinting at the idea that messengers could come deceiving the person on, uh, the, the human on earth that they've come to, to been, that they've been sent to, to reach out to, and come in a false identity Meanwhile, in later theology in the temple, when the endowment is created, Joseph Smith and those after him uh, create where Peter, James, and John essentially do the same thing and go down not under their true identity. Doesn't that right. seem strange? That's very interesting. Yeah, it is strange. Of course, it's also possible one way to unravel this riddle, Mr. Real, is that Nephi is Jesus's new name. It's his new name. Um, and there was more to it than that. So I'll put slide nine up. He also stated that this Nephi, who Bishop said, and again, in one document, Bishop said was one of the three Nephites from the Book of Mormon. And I'll give you a moment to talk about that here in a second. But yeah. that he had 
these sacred objects, and they were the same sacred objects that Joseph Smith Jr. had. Uh, he had the Liahona, he had the gold plates, he had the Sword of Laban, he had the Urim and Thummim, he had the breastplate of Moroni, and he had the 116 uh, manuscript pages, the lost 116 pages. He had the manuscript. I got Don Bradley's version up there. Um, but but the 116 pages. And then he claims that he had this silver crown, which represented the Aaronic priesthood, and that that at the early church, Joseph Smith had this. But I've never in all my research ever come across a claim that Joseph Smith had an artifact of a silver crown in his possession from the ancient uh, authors of the Book of Mormon. And you probably have never heard that either, I assume. No, I've never heard of it. What are your Dan thoughts Bullock's out there commenting? Maybe he'll let us know if he's heard of it. I would love that. Um, but tell us a little bit, the story about Nephi and him being one of the, the 12 disciples in the book of Mormon, this doesn't quite add up, does it? Well, if he said that Nephi was one of the three Nephites, right? One of the three Nephites, one of those three of the 12 disciples that Jesus chose when he showed up in America and ordained. Um, well, Third Nephi does give the names of all 12 of them, and the main guy is Nephi, right? But this was always a missionary chestnut. This kind of jogged my memory when I was reading this a few days ago, that missionaries would try and figure out, okay, so can we glean from the Book of Mormon who these three Nephites were? And the answer is ultimately you can't. But one thing you do know is that Nephi was not one of them. Because in 4th Nephi, we read about his dying. So that was always the, the thing, right? Uh, we don't know who the three Nephites are, but we know that Nephi wasn't one of them. And yet it sounds like uh, Gladden Bishop. And I'm just using his middle name because I understand that's generally how he's referred to in a lot of documents. It's Francis Gladden Bishop, but that's a lot to say every time. That Gladden Bishop felt differently about it. Maybe he'd gotten through 3rd Nephi, but hadn't quite gotten through 4th Nephi. He, yeah, he probably reads it about as much as the other members usually do. What's well, all those Isaiah chapters? You get stuck there. There are actually a couple of them in the end of 3rd Nephi, but not as bad as 2nd Nephi. Right. And I'm going to put in the comments, I couldn't find this document. This is the document where it's reported that Francis Gladden Bishop claims he was visited by Nephi, one of the three Nephites among the 12 disciples in the Book of Mormon. But when I click the link... Uh, nothing comes up. So if anybody has this document, I know we won't be able to use it for the episode tonight, but I would be deeply interested in reading that uh, if somebody has that handy and could could shoot over a copy that I could read. Um, but there's that. And so he has these artifacts. Then he claims to have this other artifact that um, is kind of new to uh, Mormon history, which is he has a gold crown as well, which represents the Melchizedek priesthood. And... Uh, this idea of crowns, it doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me. Um, I don't really, you know, again, I know that the Book of Mormon talks about kings and king men and all that kind of stuff, but I don't really sense that the religious faithful are really spending a lot of time trying to create crowns and be kings uh, within. Well, except within, for Joseph Smith. Yeah, except for Joseph Smith, who wants to take over the world, run for president and, and, uh, and be king of the earth. But in the Book of Mormon, you don't really see this sort of idea play out. Oh, no. Kings are frowned upon in the Book of Mormon. Yeah. Um, it says... Uh, well, ex I'm sorry. Except when they're not. Except when they're... Um, so he had these seven sacred items. He claims that the first six were in possession of Joseph Smith, but now he has a seventh as well. And so are those the Liahona, the plates, the sword of Laban, the spectacles, the yep. Yep. Uh, the breastplate, right? So those are the ones that I'm familiar with that Joseph Smith uh, was supposed to have in his possession, although not a lot of people saw anything except for allegedly seeing the plates. But on top of that, you got the silver crown and a gold crown. Did anybody ever see these? I don't want to get ahead of you, but is he just making these claims or did we, anybody we, ever say yeah. they saw them other than Gladden Bishop? Um, we'll get to that there. He certainly, just like Joseph Smith, he has witnesses, um, Bishop. So he called these the crown of Israel, silver crown of Israel representing the Aaronic priesthood 
and a larger uh, gold crown of glory representing the Melchizedek priesthood. He also claimed to have the 116 pages of English manuscript of the Book of Mormon, which have been translated by Joseph Smith, but lost by Martin Harris. Seven days after receiving these items, Bishop claimed that he was washed uh, and anointed and robed in vision, placed upon a throne, according to one commentator, quote, to Bishop, this completed his calling as upon him was conferred divine authority and kingship, unquote. Reminds me a little bit of the second anointing, uh, but he certainly claims to have this additional ordinance and anointing that makes him extra super special. And didn't he also claim to be David? Yep. Following the event, Bishop claimed that he was David, the king that shall reign over the United Nation of Israel. Right. So there's the old messianic expectation from the Old Testament finding itself uh, in early Mormonism. Well, with Gladden Bishop, I think that Joseph Smith was uh, keying into that as well. His son, the one that was born posthumously to Joseph Smith, was named David, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. David Hiram Smith. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. And uh, a few families in Illinois and Iowa, here's where you were asking that question. A few families in Illinois and Iowa believe that Bishop was a new prophet. Other Latter-day Saints called these followers of Bishop Gladonites. During this period of time, Bishop's leadership attracted the devotion of Martin Harris, one of the three witnesses of the Book of Mormon and one-time apostle in the church. Martin Harris fell for a lot of things. And he falls for the for Francis Gladden Bishop. He becomes a witness to the restoration of the restoration uh, of the Gladdenites, at least for a short time. And at least it should be noted here, we place so much emphasis on the three witnesses. And if we remember in the three witness, their, their experience becoming three witnesses, Oliver Cowdery, David Whitmer, Martin Harris – all go into the woods with Joseph Smith. Martin Harris is the one who doesn't seem like he can be gotten to believe that an experience is actually going to happen. He seems to be the skeptic in the group. And he leaves. Meanwhile, David Whitmer and Oliver Cowdery, along with Joseph Smith, have some sacred experience, they say. And then Joseph goes and finds Martin, and after some time of talking to him, in some way convinces him to allow the experience to happen. And Martin reports that it did. And I just want to note that Martin was the skeptic in that experience. He took additional work and conversation to get him to see the, the things happening. Meanwhile, he constantly, once he leaves the church, he's constantly joining movement after movement, after movement, including things outside of Mormonism completely. I think he's with the Quakers for a while, for instance. And any church that came along seemed to have an easy time getting Martin to believe. And uh, Francis Gladden Bishop is no different. He also has the has Martin Harris as his uh, one of his witnesses for a while. See, that's the interesting thing about Martin Harris. By the way, parenthetically, I'm not sure colorizing this photograph is doing any good for <laughs> Martin Harris. I'm glad I didn't have. I wasn't drinking anything when you put that up on the screen because it really gave me a jolt. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's not just that he will follow other religions, right? But that he will be a witness to their sacred artifacts, just as he was to the plates of the Book of Mormon. Is that correct? Was he a witness to the artifacts or at least some of them? Um, I don't, I don't think that. that, I don't know that. I, I don't have any uh, statement. I just know that he is one of the witnesses to the work that Francis Gladden Bishop is doing, but I don't have any statement that he claims or that Francis Gladden Bishop claims that Martin Harris saw the artifacts. Okay, because I think he was a witness for the plates that uh, James Strang claimed to have during his period when he was with the Strangites. Yeah, it doesn't seem like it took much to get Martin to go along with you. No, Other, th no, other than in that original experience in the woods. You mean the deer? No, no, the well, not that. I'm talking about with Martin, with Albert Cowdery and... <laughs> David Whitmer, dear Jesus, go back and watch it. Folks, if you don't know that reference, go back and watch the Kane Bigfoot episode that we did uh, a year ago or so. And uh, we have quite a laugh with dear Jesus where Martin Harris sees a deer 
in the woods and believes that that is the personage of Jesus Christ, which again points to how gullible Martin was. The only moment in church history and outside of it that Martin Harris seems to be less gullible than the people around him is when he's with David Whitmer and Oliver Cowdery. Right. He doesn't just see Jesus and the deer. They actually have a, um, a remarkable conversation as they walk along. Yeah. Yeah. They talk to each other. This is one of your three witnesses. This is one of the guys that you place your faith in and go, I know it's true because that guy says so. <laughs> hap, 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 happy talk. Talk <laughs> about things you like to do. All right. So on the 8th of April, uh, following a meeting of one of his followers in the temple, Bishop received a revelation which stated, quote, Thus saith the Lord, even Jesus Christ, the everlasting Father, who was and is and is to come the first and the last. Behold, I have again commenced a work on the earth, even that spoken of in the Book of Mormon, when I would bring forth the greater things to those who receive the Book of Mormon. And therefore I have again sent mine holy angels, even as to Joseph Smith at the first, and put into the hands of my servant Gladden the same sacred things which I put into the hands of my servant Joseph, and also other sacred things which have been hid up to come forth when I should set up my kingdom on earth. And here's the money line. And therefore that my word might be fulfilled and also that my people might believe, have I caused that my servant Gladden should call witnesses to these things. So he does intimate that somebody's going to witness them. And he does Mart mention Martin, even he who was one of the three witnesses to the book of Mormon, my servant, Martin Harris, and also my daughter, Phoebe, which was Bishop's wife in that convenient by the way, if you think that's convenient, you ought to know that the eight witnesses were all members of the Smith family or the Whitmer family. Married in. Yes, good point. Biological. Yes. Good point. It sounds like the extra thing. So, so God has given to Gladden Bishop all the things that Joseph Smith had, including things he didn't have, which would have to include the two crowns and the 116 pages, which Joseph Smith would have liked to have, but didn't have them for long. And if anybody could give those... Back to Francis Gladden Bishop, it would be Martin Harris, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> this is like uh, he's sort of atoning for past sins. Yeah. And so his wife, Phoebe, is going to be a witness as well. And he says, whom I've called these many years that she might be a witness in this and my great and glorious work, which I have now begun and which shall never be overthrown. Of course, the once the church is restored, it'll never be taken away, right? Even right, though I've heard somebody that before. And here's somebody building on the last guy who said that, but now says he's fallen. And behold, right. my witnesses have borne their testimony before my people in this place, yea, and in my house, even that which my people have built and dedicated unto me in Kirtland. I also just want to note, you know, Chris uh, Namelka, who has the uh, sealed portion, it's the big white book right there at the end of my finger. Um, it's Chris Namelka claims that he translated the sealed portion of the Book of Mormon. And there are other folks. There's some guy in Canada who did this. Uh, there's some guy in South America who claims that he's got the sword of Laban and he's translating the sealed portion. It doesn't seem that hard for people who want to connect themselves to the restoration and claim authority to create language that sounds similar to the revelations of the Doctrine and Covenants or the scripture of the Book of Mormon and we place a lot of emphasis on Joseph Smith having done this incredible thing. And I just want to note that there are like a dozen other people connected to Mormonism who seem to create uh, the language of the sacred writ that Joseph Smith did or the commandments that Joseph Smith did with the DNC. And it doesn't seem to be too difficult for these folks to do it. Yeah, I can I can think of a way that we can figure out which of these latter day translators of the 116 pages is correct. We just compare them with the 116 pages that Gladden Bishop had. Right, and then we would know, wouldn't we? Absolutely. Chris Namelka might have it back there. Um, all right. So, by the way, I I, yeah. I say that in jest, but there is a thing that goes on, and it's happened uh, for thousands of years, where a particular document will have gaps in it, places where the story is not covered. And it has traditionally been an irresistible temptation to later authors to go back 
and create stories to fill in those gaps. One of the classic examples is of the childhood of Jesus. So we don't, we know nothing virtually, except he goes to the temple and, uh, you know, when he's like, he's talking to the elders, I think he's 13 or 14 or 12. I can't remember, <clears throat> but that's basically all we know about Jesus between the time he's born and the time that uh, he starts his ministry and gets baptized by John the Baptist. So later authors were very happy to come in and start writing stories or collecting stories that perhaps were in circulation orally. And there is the infancy gospel of, uh, let's see, there's the proto evangelium of James. And I think it's the infancy gospel of Thomas, which are the two famous books that do this, but with 116 pages having been existed or having existed, and then being lost and never found. This is another classic gap where creative authors come in and create what it is that should have been there. The surprise would be actually, if you know history the way it happens like this, the surprise would be if there were no authors coming forward and saying, we've got the correct translation of the 116 lost pages. Yeah, and if one has any understanding of biblical scholarship or biblical studies, biblical criticism, and most Mormons don't, most believing faithful Mormons are clueless to, to all of that material. But the reality is, as you're pointing out with the infancy gospels of Jesus Christ, we recognize that the very first gospel written is Mark, and it ends like a chapter nine, verse whatever. I'm going to say verse uh, nine or so. Well, probably 18, and chapter 18. Yep. And uh, chapter 18, verse nine. And so what happens is somebody comes in and writes an additional few verses to finish off the book of Mark. And then decades later, other authors come forward and propose even completely different stories of Jesus, which is Matthew, Luke, and John. And if anybody understands, again, biblical scholarship, they would recognize that those four gospels contradict each other deeply. And somebody comes along and is proposing to go like, hey, the story doesn't go far enough. Let me tell the parts that haven't been told. Um, and these folks are decades later. And I think in John's case, we're talking about uh, about 80 to 110 years after the life of Christ. Um, it, when you recognize, as you point out, when you recognize that somebody doesn't complete the story, it is inevitable if the document is important enough that someone will come along and propose to add, add an addendum or put in the precursor. Right. Another obvious example is the 40 days between Jesus's resurrection and his ascension. Yeah. Much of the Apocrypha, the gospel of Thomas or whatever, like, uh, much of the Apocrypha are attempts to um, put Jesus in a different light and, and have him either teaching something or doing something that isn't in the earliest material. Yes. All right. So um, with that, in 1851, Bishop and his followers moved to Kirtland, Ohio. Again, he's out of the church at this point. They won't let him back in. Joseph Smith has passed away, and Brigham Young and others are even less forgiving of, of his shenanigans than, than Joseph was. Um, so he goes back to Kirtland, where the church was headquartered. One of Bishop's goals in returning to Kirtland was to acquire ownership of the Kirtland Temple which the church was forced to abandon and uh, and had been unable to sell it. And if folks know that story, there was this dispute between um, the, I think it was the Community of Christ and the uh, Salt Lake LDS faction of Mormonism. Brigham Young wanted to own the Kirtland Temple, but couldn't get it. And there were other groups, other splinter groups that tried to kind of come in and, and suggest that they had rights to it. But I think it ended up being in the possession. I know it is today in the possession of the community of Christ. The Gladnites were unable to gain legal possession of the Kirtland Temple. Several other attempts at collecting and holding a following proved ineffective as well. So here we go. We've got a proposed successor to Joseph Smith. And like many of them, he sort of falls flat on his face. Um, wow, with all of those similarities to Joseph Smith, I'm almost surprised that Gladden Bishop didn't claim to have a first vision experience. He actually did. I actually have it here. Let me put it up on the screen. Um, I'm glad you led to that. Let me, in fact, let me uh, let me make this bigger. Francis retired to the forest and engaged in solemn prayer to God, relating the experience three decades later. Again, he writes about it three decades later. 
That should bother us. But if it does, what else should bother us, RFM? I don't know. 12 years for Joseph Smith. I think Joseph Smith wins this competition. Joseph Smith takes 12 years to write his first vision experience down. That's the one that got hidden and stored in the safe because it wasn't acceptable because only one being is talked about is appearing. But if it took 30 years for Gladden Bishop to write it down, then obviously Gladden Bishop's is false and Joseph Smith's is true. Yes. Um, relating the experience three decades later, he remembered becoming insensible to the surroundings as he prayed, then of becoming aware of spirits around him in the air, yet none of these spirits seemed plainly visible. Before him appeared a wall with an open doorway through it a brilliant light. Through his, this opening, three persons passed into view. I was in a perfect ecstasy while gazing upon the heavenly visitants, he later wrote. The trio looked on the boy and smiled then ascended to the aperture and passed from view. Immediately this is following, like a scene out of Poltergeist. Yeah. Immediately following their Everybody, departure. Sorry, I keep interrupting. Go no, ahead. No, you're good. Um, immediately following their departure, a different personage appeared. This individual, he reported, came as a man, said Francis. His hair was gray and hung curled around his shoulders, and his countenance was dignified beyond all I ever conceived of human majesty. He too wow. smiled on the boy, Soon the vision closed and released back into consciousness. Francis' mind engaged in contemplating the meaning of what he had just experienced in the vision's significance. Perhaps like the visionary Daniel, he could have said that my cog, my, uh, I don't even know what that word is, my cogitations. Cogitations, very good. My cogitations much troubled me and my countenance changed in me, but I kept the matter in my heart. Francis finally settled on the interpretation that the first three figures had been angels, while by an impulse of the same character, I saw the fourth to be the Ancient of Days, of whom I had read in the prophecy of Daniel. This character, the Ancient of Days, would become central to Bishop's religious interpretations and in later views of contemporary events. It seems so strange to me that he's not given any meaning, and he just derives it all on his own after the experience is over. It is interesting because one wonders how often that happens. <clears throat> yeah, one wonders, don't they? Um, yeah. Uh, it, 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 certainly. And, you know, Joseph Smith, you can say a lot of things about the similarities of these. There's things about holding it in my heart and uh, uh, the hair was gray and hung curled around the shoulders. The countenance was dignified beyond all I had ever conceived of human majesty. There are similarities not necessarily the exact words, but the ideas that are being conveyed uh, by the verse vision versus what Francis Gladden Bishop claims to have experienced. All right. Um, I just want to know, do the ancient of days have antlers? Yeah, I don't think so. I don't think so. He doesn't Martin, mention them at least. No, maybe Martin would have tried to convince him that, but uh, it doesn't seem that happened in his original telling three decades later. Uh, in 1852, uh, leaders of the Latter-day Saints who had followed Brigham Young announced that the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints were teaching and practicing plural marriage in Utah, uh, in the Utah Territory. Shortly thereafter, Bishop received a revelation from God that his followers should go to Utah, where the Gladdenites would wrest control of the LDS Church from Young by leading an uprising of the members of the LDS Church against polygamy. Bishop himself did not make the overland trip. Several of Bishop's followers in Utah began preaching in the streets of Salt Lake City in March of 1853. On March 20th, from a wagon in front of the old tabernacle, several believers noisily accosted residents as they left church meetings. When several men attempted to push or pull the wagon out of the area, the city marshal dispersed the crowd. A week later, another meeting was prohibited entirely by city officials. Alfred Smith, a member of the LDS Church who defected to the Gladdenites and had accused Young of robbing him of his property, was arrested and imprisoned until he gave promise to Young to discontinue his rebellion. And so now we get Brigham's response, and I want to get your thoughts on this. On March 27th, Brigham Young made the subject of the Gladdenites the focus of his Sunday sermon in the Salt Lake Temple. See if you hear any similarity here. In his sermon, Young stated, we want apostates of the church to go to California or anywhere they choose. 
I say to those persons, you must not court persecution here, lest you get so much of it, you will not know what to do with it. Do not, and the not is in all caps, do not court persecution. We have known Gladden Bishop for more than 20 years and know him to be a poor, dirty curse. I say again, you Gladdenites, do not court persecution or you will get more than you want and it will come quicker than you want. I say to you bishops, do not allow them to preach in your wards. Who broke the roads to these valleys? Did this little nasty Alfred Smith and his wife? No, they stayed in St. Louis while we did it, peddling ribbons and kissing the Gentiles. I know what they have done here. They have asked exorbitant prices for their nasty, stinking ribbons. And then the voices in the crowd, that's true. We broke, <laughs> yeah, we broke the roads to this country. Now, you glad knights, keep your tongue still, lest sudden destruction come upon you. I say, rather than that the apostates should flourish here, I will unsheath my buoy knife and conquer or die. Great commotion in the congregation and a simultaneous burst of feeling assenting to the declaration. Now, you nasty apostates, clear out or judgment will be put to the line in righteousness to the plummet. Then the voices in the crowd go, go it, go it. And Brigham says, if you say it is right, raise your hand. All hands raise. Let us call upon the Lord to assist us in this and every good work. Any thoughts from you on Brigham Young here? Well, it's really interesting because now we get the context of this favorite quote from Brigham Young of the Desnats. We did an episode on that about four weeks ago. And this is where they get their Bowie knife as their emblem from this quote from Brigham Young. And I've got to tell you, I sympathize with Brigham Young in this. I mean, here's, he's, here's these people coming out there who did not break the roads. They didn't do all the work of settling this area, all the hard work. And how, now they're coming out there and claiming, oh, guess what? Brigham Young, you're not the man. Gladden Bishop is the guy, and we're going to come out here, and we're going to try and wrest control of the church away from you. Yeah, my sympathies are with Brigham Young. Not necessarily with the whole Bowie knife stuff, but yeah, I can understand why he'd be a bit peeved at Gladden Bishop at this point. But Brother Bishop has the sacred relics. Oh, that's right. He's got the crowns. The crowns. So both scholars and Latter-day Saint apologists have pointed out that none of the Gladdenites were actually harmed by Young or members of the LDS Church, that, Young, that Young's invective-filled speech was largely meant as a rhetorical message to the Gladdenites, and that the LDS Church did not want them remaining in Utah, and that within two weeks, Young, in fact, backed down from his heated rhetoric. So I went looking for what Young said afterward, and I think this is it. Quote, I wish to say a few words about some men and families in this city called Gladdenites. This is Brigham Young. We have been pretty severe on them, but nowhere except in the pulpit, to my knowledge. I counsel my brethren to keep away from their houses, let them alone, and treat them as courteously as you would any other person. That message doesn't seem to be picked up by Desnat. No, it doesn't. You would think that they would know Brigham Young better or well enough to know that he rescinded that Bowie knife statement. So maybe they can watch this show. They can find the South. They can get rid of the Bowie knives and quit being so dang violent in their rhetoric. Yeah. By the way, I will say that uh, Brigham Young apparently didn't do any violence according to this thesis and none of the Mormons did. But I can't overlook the fact that he did throw one of these guys in jail until he recanted. Yeah. But it is no, you know, Brigham Young <laughs> seems to have repented from his original comment in a sermon and seems to be going like, look, I, I said some things. I don't, I said some violent things, but I don't think we've done any violence. It was only in this sermon. And I'm asking you guys to play nice, leave these folks alone and let them be. And again, I think it would be important for Desnat to notice that for any person who's following that movement to recognize that the impetus you have for using buoy knives in your images and memes that um, that you recognize that Brigham Young walked away from that statement and changed his rhetoric and in a, in a sort of way apologized and wanted to move on, distancing himself from what he had said earlier. Yeah, I think that is important. And I do get the sense of Gladden Bishop 
that he's an individual who watches other people create things and then he wants to seize control of them. Yeah. So they move from Kirtland. They uh, then claim to want to take over Utah. Then they move to Illinois. Then they go to Iowa, then to Nebraska, and then finally ends up in Utah again. I want to share a little bit from his time in Nebraska. Um, He's run out of state. Yeah, yeah. He goes from place to place. It's it's not really working. You know, you try to accumulate Mormons and it doesn't seem to be going so well. Uh, but he does go state to state. And we've seen that play out before, haven't we? Yes, we have. Yeah. Very good. So by about 1860, uh, Bishop and his followers had settled near Oconee in Platt County, Nebraska, where Bishop continued to head what he called the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The Gladdenites were active in attempting to convert settlers and Native Americans in the area, but with little success. This is a picture of Joseph Smith. Obviously, I recognize the image as deeply offensive, but I'm showing a piece of art here. I'm just noting that Francis Gladden Bishop tried to carry out a similar mission to Joseph Smith and tried to convert the Lamanites when in reality, the Native Americans didn't seem to want anything to do with it in the same way that the Joseph Smith's movement and the Book of Mormon attempt to be a way to reclaim the Native Americans as Lamanites and that the book was written to them, they were going to play a monumental role in the restoration of the church, and the modern church has had to completely distance itself from those early claims of the Book of Mormon and of Joseph Smith, because getting the Native Americans to join Mormonism in a significant number has fallen flat on its face as well. Well, that's certainly true. You know, it's easy uh, as a TBM, which I'm not anymore, but I can remember, to look at Joseph Smith and say, this is the real deal, and look at Gladden Bishop and say, he's an obvious imposter. But if I'm trying to look at this more objectively, I'm not sure I can give a rational basis for saying Joseph Smith is the true prophet and Gladden Bishop is the false prophet. What do you think? They both seem to be doing the same sorts of things uh, the only thing I think you could argue differently is that Joseph Smith seems to have had more success creating a following and maintaining it. But if that's the basis on which we judge that his movement's true, then other factions like the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Seventh-day Adventists would have to be considered because their movements grew at the same or better rate than Mormonism did. Right. Well, Jesus would be included in that category of people who failed miserably. In establishing a church and i think joseph smith had something to say about that by the way maven do you have an announcement to make um i just want to thank ray for a very generous donation that he made um um i don't know i don't want to embarrass him but we'll oh, let's embarrass him a, a, a thousand bananas <laughs> a thousand, a thousand bananas <laughs> yeah well pickles actually it's there's a whole pickle thing going on <laughs> in the chat so a thousand pickles have been donated to Mormonism Live. Um, thank you so much, Ray. We we really appreciate that. That means a lot. It, it, again, thank you, Ray. The money that we bring in through donations is how we fund what we do here, and it's how that we sp are able to spend the time we do researching these things to be able to share these stories with you. Oftentimes, showing the church in uh, either totally reversing its doctrine or changing things. In this instance, I think we're actually to some degree siding with the church and pointing out one of the folks uh, suggesting they should have been the leader in the succession crisis as being uh, that their claims being on this absurd side. Uh, but we try to play it fair and we try to be honest to the material. And um, anyway, I want to say thank you for the donation. Yes. And I'm going to dedicate this next comment to Ray. That when we're looking at first vision accounts, right? When we're looking at uh, Joseph Smith's first vision account versus, I almost said Ray's first vision account. Uh, maybe he's had one too. Maybe he's having one now. Um, Gladden Bishop's first vision account, right? I think that a TBM would easily see that Gladden Bishop's first vision account appears to be derivative from Joseph Smith's first vision account. I think what a TBM has more difficulty seeing is that Joseph Smith's first vision account is derivative of other accounts of people in his neighborhood and his 
milieu. Thank you, Martine. Love it. Love it. Love it. Um, okay. So this is where I, this isn't a big part of the story, but uh, I thought it was interesting. So around 1863, quote, unsavory reports in regards to the orgies, which were a part of their Sunday exercises in the windowless church came to the ears of the outside world and created such discussion that their condition became unpleasant to them and their presence obnoxious to the settlers. So folks are near the building of the Gladden Knights. By the way, I blurred out, I think, every inappropriate part of this uh, this picture. So I think we're okay. Oh, you missed a spot. Uh-oh, did I? I <laughs> I'm just imagining no, Bill, you oh, I did. going through <laughs> and blurring all of these. Um, I love yeah. it. I'm glad I wasn't given that assignment. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I missed one. So... Um, Anyway, let's move on. So uh, unsavory reports about orgies. And I, I had to go looking because I had my suspicion about the word and how it's been used throughout history. And I just want to note that if you look up the word orgies in, in terms of how that word has been used throughout time, it, mean, it can mean uh, a group of people having uh, sex as a, as, a, as a group, but it can also mean drunken foolishness and other kinds of like... Uh, having too much to drink and just getting a little too crazy, but not necessarily having a sexual component to it. So I don't know what was meant by the people of the town, but they reported watching in on the glad nights and, uh, and seeing them or hearing them having an orgy and then being kind of really uncomfortable with these folks staying in town. Yes, and for the backyard professor, the hidden pickle in the picture is in the geographical center. Okay, I'm, I'm going to leave it up for just a moment. Bill's, Bill's scrutinizing it real close now. Hey, I, don't, um, I don't see anything, but I'll, I'll move on. This has been historically what it is that uh, people say about other religious groups that they really hate, you know, is that they're doing all sorts of things in their temple. You know, they said these things about the early Christians, the orgies, the stealing of the babies, the drinking of their blood as the sacrament, the eating of their flesh as part of their sacrament. These are the kind of stories that circulate. You and I were talking about this earlier in the week, that um, in the time of early Christianity, the, the, the social state of the people was such poverty that if you couldn't afford to feed your family, you would take your newborn baby and put them outside the house to allow them to starve to death or freeze to death, either way. And the Christians would come along and, and rescue these babies and then um, raise them. But because Christian theology has the eat of my flesh and drink of my blood, the accusation comes along by these folks who put their child outside to die, that the Christians have taken these children and are eating them as an act of cannibalism. And it seems, as you pointed out, you said this, like it's so much more horrible to rescue these babies and raise them with some crazy theology than it was to leave them on the doorstep in the first place. Right. And I think I said it with a sarcastic uh, tinge to my yeah. voice. Yeah. I mean, there's leaving them out there to starve and freeze to death. At least the, the Christians, they knocked them over the head really hard. They were out of their misery. And then the sacrament ensued. Yeah. All right, we're going to get this off the screen. Uh, in June or July 1864, Gladden Bishop traveled to Salt Lake City with the intention of meeting with Brigham Young. Oh, yeah. Him. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Brigham, hey, Brigham. Brigham. Knock, knock, knock. You got, a, you, got a, you got an hour for me, Brigham? I'd like to yeah. talk to you about a few things. Uh, he wanted to, Gladden Bishop wanted to allow the Mormons access to the seven sacred objects he claimed to hold and ushering in the reign of the Ancient of Days. Um, evidence from the correspondence and genealogical records shows that he traveled to Utah in 1863. He wrote to Brigham Young from Denver on the 20th of March, 1864. He arrived in Salt Lake in June or July, 1864. By the way, I don't have it handy in front of me, um, but the church on its website, when it is uh, cataloging the pioneers and the companies that came in does acknowledge that Francis, Francis Gladden Bishop 
uh, came in with a LDS company that they don't know specifically which company it was. They have a whole list of miscellaneous pioneers they knew came in, but they but they don't have those folks uh, cataloged on which company they came in on. But he was traveling with the Latter-day Saints. I wondered why that might happen. And you suggested, I think. Well, yeah, it's a lot safer to travel in a group out to Salt Lake rather than go by yourself. Right. So if you're somewhere else and you want to get to Salt Lake City in the mid 1800s, your best bet is to find another group of LDS converts or members who want to join the Saints and to put your bags on with their company. Okay. Yeah, I would think so. Of course, there were a lot of people who were going to Salt Lake, at least in passing, who weren't Mormon. But yeah, you got to have a lot of people with you so you don't end up as a body on the planes. Correct. All right. So um, he also wanted to usher in the reign of the Ancient of Days. And we're getting kind of towards the end here. Uh, I just want to note some of the things. This guy wrote several things, and some of these are still available on Amazon, by the way. So he wrote this uh, proclamation um, that I've got in front of me that I showed uh, at the beginning of the show, this broadside that Michael Marcourt reproduced. Uh, he wrote an address to the sons and daughters of Zion scattered abroad through all the earth, Kirtland, Ohio, 1851. Uh, Zion's Messenger was a periodical written and edited by Gladden Bishop and was published in Council Bluffs, Iowa. There's only one recorded issue that appeared in 1854. He wrote a brief history of the church, which I mentioned earlier, in Salem, North Carolina. Blum and Son was the publisher, 1839. An address to the sons and daughters of Zion. I think I already said that one. And then the, you know, some of this stuff, like I said, the two books there, you can still buy on Amazon. They weren't super cheap. I think 40 or 50 bucks or something, but you could still Whoa. purchase his writings. Um, so there probably is still somebody out there that is intrigued or maybe even following uh, the Gladdenites. Well, amazingly enough, it's published under the Forgotten Books series. Yeah, the Forgotten Books series. <laughs> and now and now we've made them a little hard to be forgotten, a little harder. Um, right, right. All right, death and conclusion here. So... Uh, there's his gravestone. He lived quietly in Salt Lake City with his sister for several months and died there during a scarlet fever outbreak in late November 1864 on the 30th. There's his grave marker. He was Which buried. Which 1865. Yeah, and you noted that, that it has the incorrect date on it or the, the history documentation has the wrong date, but at least to note that. Um, he was buried in his sister's family plot, but was interred in the wrong grave. I hate After, when that happens. It, yeah, it, it, this reminds me, by the way, the date and being put in the wrong grave. It reminds me a little bit of Simon's writer and the misspelling of disciple. Um, but On his gravestone, right? Yeah, on his gravestone. After yes. Bishop's death, the Gladnite church disintegrated in the sacred relics were not found among his personal possessions. So Moroni or Nephi, and again, that error also occurs in early Mormonism with Joseph Smith, but Moroni or Nephi must have come to, got, to, to pick them up and take them back. I think you're right. It looks like this particular burial plot was filled to the brim. Yeah, there's a lot of bodies in that underneath that tombstone, huh? Okay, I'm waiting for it to land. <laughs> okay, I don't know. <laughs> um, just to what are all their here. names? What are all their names? Andrew Ruhamanaha Joseph. The last Francis. name. The last names. Br oh, Brim, 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 Bishop Brim. <laughs> this is the wrong grave he's interred in. <laughs> it's filled to the brim. It's filled to the brim. <laughs> That's okay. I'll keep going on it until you get it. Sorry, I didn't look at it. One of these things doesn't belong here. Yeah. Um, and I just want to know, you and I are having a conversation. You and I were having a conversation earlier today. We were talking about this Nephi and Moroni and Peter, James, and John versus the three of the Nephites or whatever Gladden Bishop's claiming. But there is some degree of more rational argument to be made with uh, Nephi if if he's one if he's one of the three Nephites, which you've already shown that's an error and that that doesn't make sense according to the way Book of Mormon is written. 
and Nephi dies and we have the names of all 12 and none of the other 12 are named Nephi. But it does at least make sense to me that in Mormonism, we have Moroni who is taking the plates back and forth, returning them to Joseph Smith's possession when he repents, taking them away again when the project's over. And to note that as far as we know in Mormonism, Moroni is a spirit. He's not a resurrected being. And we have the DNC where it says that when you meet a spiritual minister, uh, an angelic uh, minister, uh, ministering servant, that if you attempt to shake his hand, he will refuse because if he did try to shake your hand, your hand would go right through his. And to note that the devil will attempt or his spirits will attempt to shake your hand and your hand will go through. And so it doesn't make any sense that Moroni could carry the plates because they're a physical object. And if you can't shake a physical hand, you sure as hell can't carry uh, a 70 pound object of Tumbaga in the color of gold because it couldn't be gold, right? And it would make more sense for one of the three Nephites to do it because they've been spared death in order to carry out the work of God on earth in the meantime, they seem like the perfect candidate to take care of the plates, whereas a spiritual uh, angel wouldn't be able to handle a physical object. And there's right. Vogel Dan Crenshaw. Vogel weighing in that Moroni was resurrected, according to Joseph Smith in the Elders Journal. Well, of course he was resurrected because he handed in the plates. Right. So you, you start with the thing, and when someone else points out the problem, suddenly you now have additional revelation that Moroni was resurrected. Right. And I'm just going to bring up this connection, which is probably not a connection at all, but I throw it out there for what it's worth. In the 1838 Manuscript History of the Church, Joseph Smith writes or dictates that the angel that gives him the plates is not named Moroni, but is named Nephi. Did I take your breath away with that one, Bill? No, no, no. I was doing the live call in studio and I needed you to talk for just another 10 seconds, but I, I couldn't do that. So I wanted to get that started and I did. It worked out fine. All right. So filled to the brim. I love that, by the way. Um, and yes, one of these things doesn't look like the others. It reminds me a little bit of Sesame Street here where they give you the one thing that doesn't belong. Um, all right. So wrapping up. Uh, Francis Gladden Bishop, this is my thoughts. Francis Gladden Bishop is a complex person who seems to be seen as both a leader because there were definitely moments in his life in the church where the other members around him are leaning on him to be the leader of the congregation. He's in charge of a disciplinary court at one point in the thesis. There are other moments where the rest of the congregation looks to him to solve a problem. And so he definitely had some leadership qualities and was placed in leadership positions. Um, he both, and he's also seen by his peers as a heretic. He both seems passionate about Mormonism his entire adult life and also seems to be positioning himself for leadership constantly. He reminds me of the old guy in your ward who was both always in some leadership position because he always showed up but was always spouting strange ideas as his interpretations of the gospel that made everyone uncomfortable and to be tolerated due to his zeal, but kept at distance for the same reason. And I think we all experienced some of those folks when we were active in the church in the wards that we were in with a high priest who tended to have some crazy ideas, but he also showed up every week and he was always helping with the moves. And, and so you can see how people can be these kinds of complex human beings. I wanted to finish with a quote from Parley Pratt. And let me throw the phone number up on the screen. If anybody wants to call tonight, uh, that's not it. That is there. You can call the show with 662-667-6667 or 662-MORMONS. No longer the old fist number, but I still get those calls once in a while. <laughs> yeah, usually on a Sunday morning around 10. Um, I wanted to read this last quote from Parley Pratt uh, that is in regards to Francis Gladden Bishop. I never heard him in any other light, but as a man or a thing that crept in from time to time among the saints with attempts to deceive the people with one imposition or another. His difficulty all the time was that the people would not be deceived by him. 
I will not put him on a level with other apostates. Where can we find one of them that has not had some influence? I know of no one that had not some followers for a while, although none could keep them, but I never knew Gladden Bishop to gain a single follower among his personal acquaintance. He doesn't He doesn't seem to want to acknowledge Martin Harris. Oh, wow. That's a good point. Yeah. So he according was, to Parley P. Pratt, this is the worst apostate ever. Yeah. He won't even put him on the same level with other apostates. No. St St James Strang, William Gladden, or uh, Francis Gladden Bishop. Um, and you know, I hear in that statement from Parley P. Pratt some frustration with Joseph Smith for letting this guy back in and forgiving him over mm. and over again. Yes, very much so. He was, and this is Parley Pratt continuing. He was disfellowshipped and received on his professions of repentance so often that the church at length refused to admit him any more as a member. I see no ground then to prove or to investigate the calling of an apostate who has always been trying to oppose, to impose upon this people. It is too late in the day for us to stop to inquire whether such an outcast has the truth. And yet we are called upon to prove what, whether an egg that was known to be rotten 15 years ago has really improved by reason of age. Unquote, Parley P. Pratt. It's a nice line. It's it a is. nice line. It is. One wonders if the same line of reasoning would apply to Joseph Smith's treasure digging days. Yeah. Um, yeah. Huh. Again, these connections, huh? Any final mm. thoughts on Francis Gladden Bishop? Otherwise, we'll take a couple phone calls and uh, that'll be tonight's show. No, I'm just really glad that you came up with. I always say, no, I have no comments. And then I have a comment. I'll say, yes, I'm so glad that you came up with this. This hitherto unknown to me individual in LDS history. How colorful. It helps us understand more about Joseph Smith, about Brigham Young, about Bowie knives, about silver and gold crowns, and about how many people were attracted to Joseph Smith who made similar claims, but then were discounted. You see, when uh, Gladden Bishop says that he has all these artifacts and that heavenly messengers have been appearing to him and ordaining him to the priesthood, that's an imposition upon the people who follow the true prophet who really had the artifacts and really had divine messengers giving him the priesthood. Right. Like why, why as a believer in Mormonism, whatever faction you believe in, why do you easily discredit all the other leaders of all the other factions, such as Francis Gladden Bishop or James Strang, and you accept a uh, whole cloth, uh, what Joseph Smith claimed. And when you look at it, you recognize that they're almost the identical same claim. Yeah. And one of the things that was really a jolt to me a number of years ago, there's um, going with James Strang and he produces his own uh, translation of plates called the law of the Lord, I believe it is. And the thing that struck me it's not only that he has witnesses for his plates, and I think one of them was Martin Harris, and he's got a translation, but that the translation contains a very large and complex chiasmus, and I think it's on the first page. And I heard that in passing a number of times. I didn't want to investigate it because that was too unsettling for me. But finally, the, the time came not too many years ago. I actually looked at it, and it was so obvious that even I could see it without having to diagram it out. But there's a very, very nice, beautiful chiasmus in James Strang's translation of his plates in the law of the Lord. And that led me to, oh, certain consternation with how to account for chiasmus in the Book of Mormon being proof of its divine authenticity. And yet the same chiasmus structure in the law of the Lord doesn't prove the same thing. Yeah, I'm just, I went and fetched my sealed portion, Christopher Nemelka. You know, this thing is not, this is not a little thing. I mean, this is, again, this is, an, this is something too, you don't, I want to connect this dot maybe for a moment. And folks, by the way, feel free to call in. We do have one caller on hold. We'll get to you just a moment. Um, if you understand the description of the gold plates, it is said that half 
to two thirds of the plates were the sealed portion. And Joseph Smith imposes that the sealed portion was entirely written by the brother of Jared, Mahanri Moriankamer. And if you understand the length of the Book of Mormon, what we have plus the 116 pages, that would be the other third to half. And so what you end up with is a book at least the size of the Book of Mormon and almost assuredly about another 50% larger would be the sealed portion, all written by one author, Mahanri Moriankamer, about the last days and the second coming of Christ and all the things that are to come. Again, the Book of Mormon is really good at prophecies up until Joseph Smith's contemporary moment where the Book of Mormon is being written. And then it's all fuzzy and vague about anything after that. Mm -hmm. And I just want to note, when you look at this, all being written by one author, and again, here's Chris Namelka. Uh, and there existeth only one pure form of government that has always existed and shall continue to exist in worlds without end. And if I read it, now this is what is meant by the Lord, commanding that cherubim and the flaming sword be placed to guard the tree of life, lest Adam and Eve put forth their hand and partake thereof and live forever in their sins. And when the I think people I've heard that before. And when the people are thus convinced that they are willing to give all that they can as a tax to these leaders, believing that they are supporting their freedom and their nation, and in this way do the peoples of the earth divide themselves. It's scriptural language. And it's scriptural language for, you know, five, 640 pages. Um, when we think of the Book of Mormon as this really magical thing that there's just no way to describe it, and then you realize some guy who's an obvious fraud is, is written a book longer than the Book of Mormon with the same sort of language of the Book of Mormon. And then you just you just have to start to wrestle with maybe the Book of Mormon, as we talked about in the automatic writing episode a couple of weeks ago. You have to wrestle with the idea that maybe the Book of Mormon isn't as special as you were, as your church with a very uh, insulated perspective taught you to see it as and maybe it's not as profound as you think and when you start to look at other works out there you begin to recognize that there are other productions that are very similar to the book of mormon even within mormonism that might even be more profound than your book of mormon hmm. well i'm glad kristen melka wrote that because the next time somebody brings up to me the book of mormon challenge well, can you produce a book like Joseph Smith did? And I say, I don't have to. Chris Namelka already did it. And it's larger. Larger. Sealed portion. So you've got Gladden Bishop gives us the 116 pages, although we don't have them. We don't have the translation. Chris Namelka gives us the sealed portion. We've almost got all of our scriptures for the restoration intact and ready to go. Perfect. Second coming right around the corner. President Nelson is spot on. All right, now I'm going to try to connect here, uh, and we'll put the call on. Bluetooth, Roadcaster. Maybe it's Chris Namelka calling in. Connected? I don't think so. No? Okay. Maybe it's that guy from South America. Mm, I don't think so. But that guy's doing stuff, too. You know, that guy isn't going to be long before he comes up with Scripture. And by the way, there is somebody who has more writings of the Jaredites or something in Canada um, and he's also got a following. He's a younger guy. He's in his like twenties or early thirties. And uh, he's got a, a, a Latter-day Saint faction break off, uh, and he's produced scripture and stuff for them. Uh, Roger, you're on the air. We've heard from you before, my friend, glad you're back. Um, are you there? Well, thank you. Yes, I am. How are you this evening? Really good. Go ahead, my friend. Okay. I just wanted to clarify something you didn't seem quite clear on earlier and that was the organization of the 70 mm. um i was ordained a 70 in 1975 the way the uh the quorums were organized originally is they 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 did it then like they're doing it now they did it by number they had the first quorum second third fourth fifth etc and um you belonged each quorum number that was uh, bigger was under the the quorum above it 
like the second quorum is under the first quorum, the third quorum is under the second, and that sort of thing. But as um, the church grew, there were so many quorums. For example, you might be a member of the uh, 89th quorum of 70. And it, it made no really sense because the 89th quorum could be spread all over the United States. They had a hard time getting together for quorum meetings. They they didn't know who their leaders were, and they didn't even know the organization was. So sometime before I was uh, ordained, they de- the church decided to to make each quorum uh, make a quorum for each stake. And um, so that that way they you, you could get together as a quorum. You knew who your quorum leaders were, et cetera. Uh, I was ordained in, in 75. We, my wife and I moved to California. And when we got to California, I was um, called and set apart as one of the seven presidents of 70 of the um, San Jose, California East State. Um, and I had uh, counselors that I called to be my counselors. And then we, we, uh, organized the missionary work in our ward and, and together with the other s- six presidents in the entire stake. So we'd have, um, organization that way. So, uh, it kind of works like it does now, except now it's all general authorities. But then it was each stake had their own quorum. And each stake had seven presidents. And uh, if we had more seven wards in your stake, then some of the wards didn't have a president. But we worked with them, too. And they, uh, we organized the missionary work in the church that way. So there's only one president um, in each ward. Roger. So there's only one president per well, ward. Well, not necessarily. There was Up not to necessarily. Um, usually, that's the way it was. Um, but I guess technically there could be more than one in one ward, but usually there was only one president in a ward. But there were seven presidents in the stake. I, hmm. Roger, I'm, I'm curious. So. Um, you you recognize again i'm going to go back in time in early church history and we know that there were these 70s and then the church seems to change exactly how that works and now there's these members of wards within a stake and the stake has these quorums of 70 was the church intimating to you and other 70s like what was what was the connection in terms of the earlier 70s in church history I got to believe the church is telling you that you're just like them. We had to hold the same priesthood. It's like uh, an elder is an elder is an elder. I mean, uh, but um, we, I hold, or I, uh, yeah, I'm still not technically out of the church, but I hold the same priesthood as any of the other 70s. There's yeah. not no difference except their general authorities, and I was just a lowly local 70 where was your authority in the hierarchy what was a 70 did they have more authority than an elder or how did that work all of the melchizedek priesthood offices are the same as far as authority is concerned um right, an elder roger, was and it, a roger? 70 hold the I'm sorry, Roger. I yeah. know it's sort of all equal and, you know, it's all really animal farm, but wasn't there an idea? I thought there was, the idea was that uh, elder and then 70 above that and then high priest above that. That was always my impression. Is there any truth to that? I was taught in at BYU when I learned about the, the priesthood in um, at BYU and my there that that they were horizontal um deacon teacher priest and and bishop are all on the same same level 
But right. um, the high priesthood is above that, and all of the elder 70 high priest and presiding high priest, which is the correct name for bishop, are on the same level as well. Yeah, that's just the stuff they always teach. I'm sure they're going to say, I mean, really, an apostle is the same as a primary worker. We've heard that, too. Yeah, that's that's what they say. But, yeah, I'm not uh, buying that. I've heard it. There's definitely a hierarchy. Not the only, There's a hierarchy the only one that, they that want I to say felt was above me. The only one that I felt was above me was the uh, Bishop Brick and the, and the stake priesthood. Yeah, and isn't that funny? Because a bishop uh, is an I, ironic. He has the ironic priesthood, right? This whole thing is just so messy. Well, I could, I, could teach, I could teach you. I could teach you about that if you want. Um, maybe not the tonight. Bishop is a okay, but he holds another office. It's called the presiding high priest of the ward. The bishop. He's the presiding high right. priest as far as the award is concerned as leadership, but his office as bishop is to, is the physical parts of the ward. And that's why you have the doctor and the covenant saying that, that a descendant of Aaron can serve without counselors. Because I always thought that when that second coming came, there would be presiding high priests over the ward. And then these, um, people that don't need counselors would come in and be bishop and just be part of the ironic priesthood. It would be two different offices at that time. Mm. Right. Mm. So I just want to say, Roger, that when I went on my mission, the seventies quorum, the one that, well, the, the seventies group that was in my ward, because the quorum statewide, like high priest, anyway, the seventies helped finance my mission because I got baptized a year and a half, a year and eight months before I went on my mission, didn't have enough to cover everything. I actually worked and earned enough to get me outfitted to the MTC across the ocean to Japan. And then I was flat broke. So I want to thank the 70 for helping to support me on my mission. And I want to pass that along to you as a former member of the 70. Thank you. Well, I, I I didn't do anything for you, but uh, you're certainly welcome. We you would have. In our uh, stake there in Orem, we had a uh, bookstore. It was the 70s bookstore. It's like uh, all the other church bookstores now, but it was run by our 70s quorum, and they took the money and the, the profits they earned from selling the books and uh, to the members of the church and use that to support missionaries on their missions. Awesome. Yes. I remember the seventies bookstore in Auburn, Washington, but I will tell you the seventies are no more. The high priests are no more as far as groups that meet together. Now it's just elders, baby. Everything's elders. Yeah. All been consolidated. That's right. That's right. They, de they received a revelation that no longer are they required, I guess. Actually, I just want you to know I did an episode about this. The thing that's interesting is that Ezra Taft Benson, when he made the announcement that the local 70s were being discontinued, he did not claim any revelation. In fact, he specifically said, we're just changing the policy, guys. Yeah. It's always a policy when it needs to be, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And I appreciated that on his part, that he didn't feel like he needed to appeal to God just to change the way things were done uh, policy-wise in the church. I wish all presidents were so humble. Yeah. Maybe the dementia played into that. Oh, I don't think. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank Roger, you, Roger. Thank Thanks you. for calling in. You're welcome. Goodbye. And Bye -bye. he's the only, he's the only call in the queue. And I kind of didn't anticipate a ton of calls with this, but what Roger said reminds me of this other problem we have in Mormonism, completely unrelated to tonight's episode, but the idea that a evangelist in the, uh, Bible New is Testament. a patriarch in the yeah. modern moment when what an evangelist was versus what a patriarch is. And any biblical scholar who understands the use of these words would go like Mormonism doesn't have a clue what it's doing there. And I always was aware of that. Even as a new convert, as I was reading and studying Mormonism, I recognized pretty early on that evangelist and patriarch, there was something Joseph Smith didn't quite get right there. 
Yeah, I'm sure it's deeper than this, but we've got evangelists in the New Testament. We don't have them in the church. We've got patriarchs in the church, and we don't have them in the New Testament. Obviously, they're in the Old Testament. We're just talking about New Testament stuff, right? And therefore, for the restored church, the LDS church, to perfectly mirror the church organization that existed in the New Testament, all we have to do is say, well, an evangelist then was a patriarch now. Yeah. And it looks like we've got two more calls coming in, so I'm going to grab one of them. Okay. I was at the brief. Caller, are you there? Hello. Hey, you're on the uh, air. What's yeah. the name? Cool. Uh, I'm Dago Vertigo. I sometimes uh, talk in the the comment section uh, on the on the videos. Perfect. Um, I'm I'm kind of calling in about something that's not directly relevant to today's episode, uh, but it's something that um, crossed my mind maybe about a month ago when Nemo was on. Uh, the idea of the brethren not really communicating very much uh, to the general membership outside of general conference and all that kind of stuff, it kind of brought to mind with, uh, with Nemo's experience that the closest thing to modern revelation that we can probably really latch on to or modern doctrinal movements within the church is uh, the church's legal filings, um, like the friend of the court filings that they do with like the Supreme Court. Like the family proclamation. So similar to the fa family proclamation, like very, very similar. So things that they don't, they don't publish it widely, but they send it to the courts. Yeah. And that wives. revelation seems, those kinds of revelations seem to emanate from the legal team of the church, Curtin and McConkie. It really does, but I think that's probably a, what the what the what the church says through the legal system is probably a more accurate reflection of the opinions of the brethren than even things that they might say um, uh, public facing through PR uh, right. outlets. Totally. Thank you. I appreciate that. That's a good point. Thank you for sharing that with us. Okay, and then we've got one other call here, and I don't know that this one ties maybe into this too. So is it Ryan? It's Ryan, yes. Ryan, you're on Mormonism Live. What's on your mind tonight? Um, well, I, I meant to call in last week, but I kind of goofed up. But um, being that you didn't have any callers, I would call in. Um, on, on this it's like testimony meeting. About the sexuality issues. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, by all means, Sorry, Ryan, I, please I, proceed. I, you're good. Or if I said something, um, the uh, November exclusion policy when they um, basically you know it was leaked that they basically said people in a homosexual marriage were practicing apostasy. Um, I was actually more offended by the way a lot of people reacted than the policy itself. Um, in that, and, and I want to be clear, there's a difference between being surprised and being upset. But I was more offended by people who were surprised than I was by the policy itself. Um, I looked at the policy and I thought, okay, of course they're going to say that. that they, like, what else can they say? Um, they, they'd spent decades, if not centuries, saying, you know, homosexuality was wrong. Homosexuality was um, subversive to the kingdom of God. It was, you know, sin next to murder. I mean, like, so if you're going to enter into a legal arrangement with it, of course you're going to be in a pot. And yet I saw so many people going like, wait, how can they do that? How can they name this apostasy? And I'm like, have you not been paying attention? Yeah, but do you and, do you sense, though, that then going one step further in saying that the children of these relationships are – and by the way, I'll, just, I'll say this too, Ryan. Mm -hmm. I just went to lunch this week with a listener. Um, we sat and had breakfast at the Black Bear Diner, and he informed me – that in you no, know, he was an older gentleman, uh, you know, 55, whatever, older than me. And okay. uh, sorry, yeah. So he's an older gentleman, older than me, 55, 60 years old. And um, he was the son of a lesbian woman who had left her husband, you know, his dad left her husband and was with a woman. And so these two women were raising this, this kid 
and he was going to church. He ends up going on a mission, ends up becoming a, a, a all in member of the church, you know, showing up every Sunday, carrying out callings. And he goes, you know what, if I would have been born at a later time during this policy, it would have affected me. I would not have been able to receive the ordinances and, and I'm all in on the church at that time. And I, I want you, I guess I just want to ask if you recognize like the next step they went, which is to punish the children of those relationships, which I think was really the impetus for most people's frustration and hurt with the policy. I don't think it was that they were um, making uh, homosexuality apostasy. I think we all knew that that was already the case. I think it was preventing the children from receiving the ordinances that really was the crux of the issue. No, and it was for a lot of people, but I think, and, and I can understand maybe this is where people are maybe a little bit more ignorant and unaware, but that is standard policy for apostasy how, what, by whatever means. Like if people um, have a polygamous marriages and they want to join the LDS church, the, the, um, they, they still have to deal with that because that, again, is also a possibility. Everything yeah, but if I I was excommunicated, church that is required of children. Right, I was excommunicated for apostasy. My wife and my children, most of them, uh, went on to quit Mormon and resigned the following day after I got my letter notifying me of the decision. But had my wife not done that, and I still have one kid on the records of the church, he just doesn't he just doesn't want to go through the effort to get it done. He doesn't believe anymore. But if my wife still believed and she wanted to go and my kids still believed and they wanted to go, they would have been allowed to participate in the church and they wouldn't have been banned from receiving ordinances. And it was, and, and so that's what makes this policy different. And I get polygamist. I understand the argument there. Um, but I also don't agree with that one per se either. I knew that uh, one of the sister, the, the show Sister Wives, uh, one of the children there tried to legitimately believed in the LDS faction, wanted to join, went through all the effort and was denied the opportunity to be baptized simply because their parents were polygamist. And that also makes no sense to me. No, I, I, I guess it doesn't make sense, but, um, and, and maybe you're being excommunicated for apostasy. I, that, that's a distinction I'd be interested in hearing about because that's one that I'm not familiar with where they, every last piece that they officially say the apostasy versus not and what so that maybe that's a bit of confusion is like apostasy maybe has been thrown around a little too liberally that where what is officially apostasy in that you know children are affected versus when it's just kind of not yeah it, so Ryan, it's my understanding right it's my understanding that it's the church that's applying the same term to all these different categories, yeah, that they're all apostates. So the church is, I believe, choosing to treat the children of some apostates differently than they are the children of other apostates. If you know what and, I mean, and it's our theology that Adam or that we are punished for our own sins and not Adam's transgression. And so doctrinally, we've made it part of our theology that every person is responsible for their own doings. And then when the church comes along and punishes children of certain sinners and not other sinners, it seems to be in deep disagreement and conflict with their existing theology. And to me, it's sort of sounding yeah, like an I, argument that two wrongs make a right. Yeah. yeah. No, and, and I understand that. I, I guess to bring around to my original point is I did, did, I did dig into these points and these details with a number of people I talked to. Um, and I don't disagree. Like, it's, it's all very valid. But at, at the same time, at the end of the day, like, there are still people who, even after all the discussion, they were still surprised that homosexuality was being considered, or, or same-sex marriage, at least, was being considered apostasy at all. As if they were expecting, like, how, how can the church be claiming this to be so sinful at all? And I'm just like, you've not been paying attention. And I think that was some, kind of a theme last week as well like there's a lot of stuff you know you guys talked about about how the church has talked about sexuality over the years that a lot of people today like never would even think about and yeah. it's like it that, that that moment back in 2015 that was the big turning point for me i mean i was already out of 
basically out of the church, um, at least physically and mentally, um, where I realized how much people in the church really don't bother staying um, aware of major uh, policies and major positions. Yeah. So, Ryan, I know we're, we were running out of time, but uh, as briefly as you can, I'm understanding you say that in November 2015, when this policy was leaked, that was something that that broke your shelf or contributed to it. Is that correct? Oh, no, I, I had already left the church um, mentally like about 10 years before that. But the policy well, bothered um, you a lot. I, I, but it bothered the, you. The, the policy, well, as, as, maybe it's the fact that as a gay man, and that's the reason I left, I was so aware of the church's positions, what had been said and done. Yeah. And so when the policy was leaked, I was just like, okay, fine, yeah, that's that's par for the course. Right. Ryan, um, can I tell you why I was surprised? I've been watching the way people and it's just the, watching the way people responded to it just mm -hmm. opened my opened my eyes even further. As like, oh wow, people really have not been paying attention at all. Right, it's like you knew it was a snake when um, you picked yeah. it up. Yeah. So can I tell you why I was surprised? Because I was surprised. The reason I was surprised is because earlier that same year. The church was making all these big announcements and video presentations about how they were all for gay rights and supporting this legislation for gay rights and how everything was moving forward in a much more gay friendly type of attitude. And then before the that same year is over, they insert into the electronic manual. They make no announcement about it. It gets leaked that at the same time they're doing all this hoopla about how wonderful the church is toward gay people and how supportive we are of gay rights. Then at the same time, or just a little bit later, it didn't get in there overnight. It took a while. I'm going to say at the same time as they're doing that, they are putting this policy into the manuals that say that gay people who are in relationships, marriages, um, or other relationships are in apostasy and their kids can't get baptized. Their kids can't receive the priesthood if they're boys, obviously they can't if they're, girl, they can't if they're girls. Mm -hmm. That in order for them to go on a mission or get the priesthood, they have to be 18 and publicly disavow the lifestyle of their parents. And that's why it surprised me because the church was giving this message publicly that was completely different and undercut by what they were doing privately. It's like that old Star Trek episode. And I can't remember all the names, but that's the one with Abraham Lincoln in it. Remember where they got the four great guys from history and they got the four really bad guys from history. And one of those bad guys was, oh, I can't remember his name, but he's described as being famous for talking peace to his opponents, to their face while preparing for war behind their backs. That was exactly what I thought of and what I thought the church was doing mm -hmm. in 2015. And that's why it surprised me. And that's why I found it so despicable. Yeah. Thank you, Ryan. You know, you, you, you're the first one I talked to who's uh, talked about how the earlier that year they had been doing that. Um, mm -hmm. So, okay, I can understand that. Um, yeah, but I see but what again, you're saying, maybe too. Maybe I just knew too much. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I, I see what you're saying, I too. I mean, too obviously, they're... That. Right. Homosexuality didn't suddenly stop becoming a sin. Right. The church had always been homophobic and against that. And so it shouldn't have surprised anybody that they did it in the first place. I, but I really do. Again, if I go back to my memory of those that moment in 2015, I gathered and I thought most people around me gathered that it seemed to be a violation or a contradiction to several of their doctrines, the church's doctrine. And it seemed to take away the main component of agency that someone was responsible for themselves. And, and I put myself and friends of mine put themselves in the place of, the mindset of a kid of someone who was LGBT, who was still wanting to participate in the church, whose parents were supportive of that, and the church now had this new policy that excluded those children from participating in the ordinances of the church, which was only going to add more embarrassment and shame to them and was only going to make things harder on them. And I, it just felt like the church went too far. Again, the, they were already too far on the, the, the homophobic stuff anyway. But to punish children, it just ran counter to what I had been taught to accept. Like I was willing to accept the homophobia 
because I was, I was taught to do so. And then suddenly I'm told to also be okay with punishing their children as well. And that made no sense to me, even as somebody who was still trying to cling to belief. No, Brian, thank it's you it's for calling in. I appreciate it. And I appreciate the conversation that you have caused here amongst us three. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Anything else from you, RFM? No, that's it. Except for last week, I announced that this week would be Randy Bell talking about this, incre this incredible new theory and all this research, this brand spanking new research that he has personally been doing, flying to different places, cross country, and taking all these great pictures, doing all this research. We're going to find out about it next week because this week, Bill Real was kind enough to take over for me because I have been busy preparing for a trial, which is going to start tomorrow morning at eight o'clock. Awesome. And anything new on the, on the Cordon front, uh, the documents being requested? No, I was just checking it again today. There appear to be two, not just mine, but there appear to be two requests that are causing some kind of hang up with the Orange County Sheriff's Department uh, uh, records custodian. And they keep moving down the page. It used to be they were at the top, but then they were obviously causing a bottleneck. Their policy as enunciated on their page is that it's first come first serve and they will respond to the request in the order in which they receive them. Well, mine was at the top of the page for quite a while. It shows it's open once they're working on it. And it'd been up there for weeks and weeks, if not months. I mean, the request was made August 30th and that's over four months, over four months and 10 days now. So over four months ago that that request was made after about a month, it became open. And since then they've been working on it, working on it, working on it. It obviously became such a bottleneck to everything else that was piling up behind and all the other requests that now they're moving it down the page and it's open moving down the page. So hopefully, hopefully whatever it is that's causing the delay will get solved sooner rather than later. And sometime, maybe this year, we'll be able to get some documents out of the Orange County Sheriff's Office and find out a little bit more about what happened that faithful, that faithful evening to Bonnie Corden's unfortunate grandchild, Derek. And somebody else is asking in the comments, would it help if other people made the same request? No. Because you will just get stuck in the same uh, queue. Yeah. So uh, it's not going to help, but I appreciate the thought. Yeah. I don't see how yeah. it would help. Well, Randy Bell next week. And at some point we're going to have to sit down and go through a ton of documents to see if we can gather any more about uh, the contradictions in Bonnie Cordon's story. Yeah. Right now the story is becoming the lack of responsiveness in my request. It's over four months and counting at this point. All right, Florida. We're watching. Okay. Have a great night, RFM. Thank you. You too, Bills. Maven, thank you for all you do behind the scenes. And everybody, appreciate each of you for watching, following. Please subscribe and like. And uh, we appreciate the donations tonight. Thank you very much. And tell your friends about us. Please share share your favorite episode. Share this one. Share next week with Randy Bell, which I think is going to be phenomenal. Everybody, have a great night. Good night, everybody.